Hello there, welcome back to The Smart Student. My name is Chelsea Seaburn. If it's the first time you're here, I'm happy you are here. And for everyone else, of course, I'm happy you are here too. But just so you know what this video is about, we're gonna talk about how to actually write literature reviews. And full disclosure, this is a two-part video series and this is video number two. So if you haven't checked out video number one, be sure to go do that because video number one is all about making sure you have the full understanding of what a literature review is. In that video, I uncover the common confusion that students seem to have with literature reviews, and I set the record straight there. And now in this video, we're going to apply our understanding to actually creating a literature review. So that being said, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, so first things first, what is a literature review? Now mind you, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this portion of the video because I have a full other video dedicated to this, but for refresher's sake, what is a literature review? Simply put, a literature review is a synthesis of the current research that's been done on a topic, current and previous. So any information, any knowledge that exists on a topic, a literature review would go out and find that information, AKA literature, and then combine it together into a synthesis to create a new piece of literature on the current state of knowledge on that topic. And now real quick, because I find synthesis can be a foreign word to some students, Synthesis is simply a combination. It's a compilation. So you'd be taking a bunch of little moving parts and putting it together into one new solid piece of literature. And now the reason literature reviews are important is because it gives you a summarized bird's eye view of a topic so that you know where to position your research later on. It's as simple as that. And so if you're watching this video right now, I'm going to assume you're probably a student. And if you are a student, I'm also going to assume that a literature review is not your first academic writing assignment. A literature review is not your first rodeo. You've probably written loads of academic writing pieces previously. And the reason I bring this up is because I like to put it into perspective that the process of writing a literature review is very similar to academic writing. However, the end result varies just a little bit. For example, with traditional academic writing, you are demonstrating your knowledge on a current topic. With a literature review, you are then demonstrating other people's knowledge on that topic. This is important that you understand that as we get into the language, because if you watch that first video, the language is what I find confuses students the most, both in formatting and writing, because in order for your literature review to be written correctly, you need to use referring language where you are constantly referring back to the sources that you found your material in. But now that we have that little bit of refresher out of the way, we're gonna jump into the actionable parts for the remainder of this video. And just so you know what to expect, what I wanna talk about is how you can structure your literature reviews, how you can organize your sources within your paper, and then we're gonna do a full-blown tutorial on that referring language. And I always like to say right here from the start, something to keep in mind is that these strategies I'm going to give you this is not a one size fits all. So don't feel like you have to pigeonhole yourself or box yourself into one of these strategies because more likely than not, you're going to apply a few of these. You're gonna mix and match a lot of the things that I'm about to give you right now. But let's go ahead and start with how you can organize your sources because this will come first because the process of organizing your sources is something you should be doing simultaneously as you research for the literature review. Okay, so let's break this thing down. Like I just said, the first step in writing a literature review is doing your research. And so when you're doing your research, it is so important that simultaneously you're evaluating each source to determine why it matters to you, where it's going to fit into your research. So organizing is an important part of the first half of writing a literature review. Because if you don't know why each source matters to you, later when you go to write your paper, you're gonna have a really hard time combining all your sources together in a logical order that makes sense, flows, and has a purpose. Mind you, this process usually takes the form of an annotated bibliography. And if you're not writing a formal annotated bibliography, there's a good chance you're writing an informal one anyways, because 
when you're researching for a literature review, you're going through a lot of sources. You're reading through a lot of articles. And so there's a good chance you are writing summaries on what you find in each one. And my pro tip for you, my best advice is to take this a step further and go ahead and write out the summary of what each source contains. And then at the bottom, include a sentence or two explaining exactly why it matters to your research. So in other words, literally put in there what the purpose of each summary is. So you understand what I mean. Let's get into five different options you could choose to categorize your sources. By the way, if you need help with an annotated bibliography, check out this video right here. You know I got you covered. But let's go ahead and start with the first one. And this one is the most common, most classic, common classic way that you could choose to categorize your sources and that is through a problem solution formatting so with this you have a topic and that topic is rooted in a problem it is centered around an issue so for example let's say your topic is plastics polluting the ocean there's your problem you're going to go out there and research a lot of different sources you're reading through all of these articles and you're writing out those summaries so i'm going to pull up an example here Let's say these are three summaries for three sources that I found. Mind you, yours is gonna have a lot more, but here's three for this example. The first one might be an article that's demonstrating the problem. It is setting the background, providing my reader with context. So I'm literally going to include a sentence at the end that says, this article demonstrates the problem, dot, dot, dot. And then go ahead and move to the second one. Let's say this one is posing a solution. This article suggests something that can be done to fix this problem. Again, I'm going to write in there that that article is a solution. And now let's say the last one is a story about the problem. It's an example of why it's a problem or evidence to that problem. Again, I'm going to categorize it based on that. So you have problem, solution, evidence. When I go to write my literature review, it's very easy for me to determine the logical order and where to plug in each source. Mind you, you're gonna rearrange some of your wording and some of your sources might be combined, some you might take material out. Obviously, you're gonna fix the formatting on the language, which we'll get into later, but that's an example. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the second way that you could categorize your sources. And that is for or against. So in other words, you're going to be categorizing your sources based on what side they stand on. So this is really good when you're writing an argumentative literature review or you're talking about a debatable topic. Right off the top of my head, any controversial topic you run into, this is a great structure to categorize your sources. So let's change directions. Let's say your new topic is about gun control. It would be very simple to categorize Categorize your sources based on sides that are for gun control and sides that are against gun control. And then your paper would simply be demonstrating the different point of views, or maybe you'd be showing the point of view in which you reside on. Simple enough, right? Now, the next way you can categorize your sources is also very easy. And this is a question answer structure. So in this example, you have a research question or an overarching question that you need to answer with your research. Well, it would be very simple to categorize your sources, some that are demonstrating the question, setting the scene for the question, showing the question to the reader, and then the rest of your sources are developing the answer or answers you've come up with to that question. And by the way, academic writing that is based on a question are gonna be some of your easiest assignments because the researching process is not too tough here because when you're researching a question, you're simply looking for answers, which is a very natural way to find information about a topic. But moving on to the next one, and this is compare and contrast. So this is most appropriate when you have a topic that has two distinct points within that topic. It's very easy to compare and contrast them, show the pros and cons of one side and the pros and cons of the other side. So for example, let's take a very general topic. Let's say you're writing a paper about the advantages and disadvantages of online classes versus taking campus classes. I'm bringing this up because I wanna show you that with a comparing and contrasting paper, there's even more flexibility in how you structure your writing. So for example, you could structure this paper by listing out all the pros and cons of online classes and then all the pros and cons of campus classes or you could list out all the pros of online classes and campus classes and then all the cons of online classes and campus classes that was a mouthful it's amazing how you think you know words until you're sitting in front of a camera and then all of a sudden you don't know words anymore but anyways let's move on because i have one more way that you can categorize your sources 
And that is, well, pros and cons. So now you have a topic that is wrapped around 1.1 thing. So let's say instead of researching or comparing and contrasting online classes versus campus classes, now you're just researching the pros and cons of taking online classes. So now you're gonna weigh the good and the bad, or you're gonna look at the advantages versus the disadvantages. And so that's exactly what you're going to be categorizing your sources and your annotated bibliography based on. So when you go to write your literature review, it's very easy to outline a paper that demonstrates all the pros and then all the cons or even a pro versus a con pro versus a con you get to choose how you structure that but as you can see once your sources are clearly categorized it's easier to organize them later on so up to this point you've done your research you're categorized all your sources now is the time to write that literature review go you now you might be wondering okay how do I actually structure my paper? And so now I wanna go over five different creative ways that you could choose to structure your writing. And this is where I say you may mix and match a few of these, but I just wanna make you aware of the different ways you can approach this. So let's start with the first one, and that is chronologically. So this, you're simply gonna be showing your topic and its evolution over time. Let's take our first example of plastics polluting the oceans. What you would do is you have your problem solution in evidence, all your sources categorized under that umbrella, and now you're going to demonstrate how they've evolved over time. Does that make sense? This is a great strategy, especially if you're studying a field that moves quickly like technology or medicine, where methods and information is constantly being updated. Now, moving on to the next strategy you could use to structure your literature review, and that is by region. This is one of my favorites because it's often one that's overlooked, but it's very creative. So for example, let's take our controversial topic of gun control. You have all of your sources categorized on for and against, evidence, examples, whatever, but now you could choose to put those into your paper and draw connections on different locations because a lot of times different locations have different opinions on topics. And so rather than showing the evolution of a concept over time, you're showing the different perspectives based on where they're located. Right off the top of my head, my mind goes to current events, things that are currently being felt worldwide, or perhaps historical events. Again, events that were felt globally and impacted people on a global scale. It's a very creative way to look at the different perspectives based on the countries they're from. But now let's go ahead and move on to another strategy. And that is to structure your paper based on the different methods that are associated with your topic. In other words, what are the different techniques, strategies, processes that are used to collect the data for that research? So for example, let's say you're in social psychology. Well here, there are a lot of different techniques used to collect data. You have observation trials, case studies, interviews, the list goes on. Well, an easy paper to write would be to write about those different methods. Now let me demonstrate what I mean, how you're gonna mix and match a lot of these strategies. So let's say you are writing a paper on the different methods being used in social psychology. Well, within that, you could be comparing and contrasting those sources. Or perhaps instead of comparing and contrasting the different methods being used, maybe you're showing the development of those methods chronologically over time, or even you're showing those different methods based on the different regions they're located. I only say this because I hope it gets those wheels turning to show you that you have options. And mind you, just how you can research the different methods associated with a topic, you can switch that out for the different theories that are associated with that topic as well. But let's go ahead and move on to the last strategy you can use before we get into the example portion. And that is a thematic literature review. So this is probably the most common or at least most commonly used because now you have a topic and you're just going to look at it from every angle around that topic. That's why it's called thematic because you're writing based on a certain theme. So here you're taking a well-rounded circular approach on your topic rather than looking at it chronologically or by region or by method. Now you have all these angles and no angle is off limits. So for example, let's say your topic is skin cancer in teens, you can analyze the methods, the progression of it over time, the causes, the treatment, no angle is off limits here. But now, guess what? It's time to write that literature review. And I get so excited here because Quite frankly, if you've done the first half correctly, you've researched, organized, categorized, and you've thought about a logical structure for your paper, 
Writing a literature review is the easy part. Doing the actual writing should go by fairly quickly. But there is one speed bump, one hiccup if you will, and that is the language of the literature review, which I alluded to, or shall we say referred to earlier, because you need to use referring language. And so what I wanna do now is I'm gonna hop into my laptop, pull up an example, and I'm gonna walk you through referring language and how to use the voice and tone correctly so you can write your literature review, okay? Come with me. And here we are. Welcome to the behind the scenes of my laptop. I'm glad you're here. And I'm excited for the tutorial portion because this means we're gonna get into the actual part of this video. So you understand what I'm about to do is I wanna start with a short refresher on what transitions are in general academic writing because that's gonna help you understand how to properly use referring language and what the purpose of it is. So first things first, like I already said, if you're a student, you've probably written at least a few academic papers before. And to correctly write an academic paper, you need to use transitions properly and appropriately. And the nutshell version of what a transition is, is that it's simply the thought bridges or thought links between your independent statements. You can also use transitions in a sentence form, linking your paragraphs together. But basically transitions, much like monkeys in a barrel, are the glue that holds the full chain of your writing together. So on the left hand side of my screen, here is a chart that I made in a previous video. I'll link this down in the description below in case you'd like to download and save it on your computer. But if you'll notice, the transitions in this chart are categorized under eight different categories. You have addition, contradiction, comparison, order and sequence, and a few more. And what these categories are is the relationship between the two statements that you're trying to connect, because that's what transitions boil down to. Rather you're using a word, a phrase, or a full sentence, you need to understand what the relationship between those two things you're trying to connect is. And so that's why on the right hand side of the screen, I have these three sentences pulled up just so we can go over a few and then we can move on to referring language. So let's go ahead and start with the first one. And you know what? I actually want to delete the transition so you can read the two sentences without it because I think that's the easiest way to understand the importance of using a transition. Okay, so preliminary research supports the hypothesis. The latest test results were not conclusive. If you read that just like that, well, it didn't make sense. Why? Well, because these two sentences contradict each other. Now that doesn't mean they don't belong in that order, it simply means you need to add in that transition because that's gonna demonstrate to the reader that the second statement is contradicting the first one. So that's why if you come over to this list, you could use however, you could use conversely, nevertheless, in spite of, any of these honestly would probably work in this place, but let's say we like however, the latest test results were not conclusive. So now reading it, Preliminary research supports the hypothesis. However, the latest test results were not conclusive. Now that flows in a logical order that makes sense to the reader. And that same principle is what applies to these other two examples here. Now with that little bit of refresher on transitions, let's apply this to the referring language. So here's a few examples of what referring language might look like. And what you need to keep in mind is referring language it takes the principles of transitions and the principles of in-text citations and basically combines the two together. So let's read through a few of these examples and see if you can hear what I mean by that. So in the article, Smith explains, because of this, Smith concludes, this chapter reviews, this article analyzes, this article demonstrates, as indicated by this study. So as you can see, this referring language is taking, taking different transitions and then it's adding in what it's referring to. So sometimes that's going to be the author's last name. Sometimes you can refer to the article or the chapter or the study or maybe even the book where you found that information. But this right here is the type of language that you need to include in a literature review. And this is exactly why literature reviews feel unnatural to students because this is the main difference between literature reviews and traditional academic writing. But now let's go ahead and work our way through actually writing that literature review. 
So first things first, as we've already discussed, you're going to have some form of an annotated bibliography. And here's mine for this example. Hang on, let me move myself up here and out of the way so you guys can see everything I'm doing. Okay, so for this demonstration, here's my annotated bibliography. And yours is going to have more sources, more information than this. But just so you know, I'm going to be working with four examples. And so what I've already done is categorize my sources so I know how to organize and structure my writing later. So mine is going to be based off a problem solution organization structure. So again, what that means is this first source, this is demonstrating a problem. The second one, well, this is providing a solution to that problem. The third one is also another solution to that problem. And this fourth one is evidence to my problem. Something I'd like to quickly point out here is that evidence is not specific to problem and solution. Evidence and examples, they fall in the same category and those can be applied to any which way you choose to categorize your sources. So for example, if you're doing a cause and effect, well, there can still be examples to support that. If you're doing any of the other ones I showed at the beginning of this video, the same stands true. And so again, here's my annotated bibliography. And I do have one quick pro tip for you. And that is that if you'll notice, I've included the in-text citations in my annotations. You don't technically have to do this when you're writing an annotated bibliography, but I do recommend doing it because that's just another step that's going to make writing your literature review that much easier. Now, also, if you'll notice, the in-text citation is in the first sentence, and then the rest of the sentences don't necessarily include in-text citations or any of that referring language just yet because when you're writing summaries for an annotated bibliography, you're more than likely going to be following traditional principles of academic writing. It's later when you write the literature review and you're shaping your paragraphs that you're going to be adding in those transitions and referring language because you have to first see how everything fits together before you can add those in. But now what you're going to do is open up your blank document. And if you're creating a standalone assignment, you'll create a title page for it. If it's a part of a larger assignment, like a research paper, well, you would have already set up your document formatting. So for this example, here is my title page. The formatting is set up. The next step is that you want to create an outline for your literature review. And so if you want to take note, my outline reflects the different categories of my sources. And so this one is easy for me to think about because I don't have too many, but as you can see, the best logical order for this paper is going to be starting with an introduction, demonstrating the problem, providing evidence to that problem, and then ending with solutions to that problem. And then of course, there'll be a conclusion to wrap up my paper. Now, I just want to point out a couple things about these section headings before I move on, and that is, even though this is a literature review, you're still going to follow the same APA formatting principles of copying and pasting your title as the first level one section heading on your paper. So as you can see here, I've labeled this so you can see it. My introduction is going to go in this first section just as it always would. And then now when it comes to level one, level two headings, I've chosen to use a level one to demonstrate the problem because to me, that deserves its own section. And now evidence, that's a subsection to the problem. So that's why I've created this as a level two section heading. And then lastly, suggested solutions to this problem. Again, to me, that deserves its own level one heading because it's its own section. And then the conclusion is up to you. You could either include it as a level one or I could bring it over to the left side and include it as a level two. And so now this turns into a fairly simple process of taking my summaries and putting them where they belong on my outline. I'm going to disclaim this one last time, and that is for this demonstration, I'm pretty much going to be copying and pasting my full summaries into my outline. When you do this on your own, you're not going to be copying and pasting all of the information from all of your summaries into your outline because realistically, you're either not going to use all the information or you're going to need to rearrange some of the information. So just keep that in mind. But here we go. This first section is the introduction. I know I'm going to write that later. So let's start with the problem, which I have right here. Let's go ahead and copy and paste that in there. Next, I'm looking for the evidence summary to put in that section. Here it is. Again, let's go ahead and copy and paste. There we go. 
And now lastly, we need to include the solution section. And now I have two solutions here and I think to myself, well, you know, these are both great, but I don't think I need to add in the information of all of them for both of them. So maybe I can combine these two together into one paragraph. And so that's exactly what I'm gonna do. When you're doing this on your own, you would think about which one logically makes sense to go first and where you would wanna combine them in that paragraph. For me, I know I'm gonna start with this second solution first because I think it does a great job of introducing a solution to this problem overall. So let's go ahead and put that here first in my solution section. Next, I'm gonna scroll up here and grab the portion of this summary that I know I want to include in this paragraph. Mind you, I'm gonna shape these later. So right now I know these, these two connecting sentences don't make sense. That's where the transitions are going to come into play later. And then also I know that I like the closing sentence from that first source better. So I'm gonna use that to close out this paragraph. And so now that I have all of my information where it belongs, let's move on to shaping these paragraphs. Okay, so let's go ahead and minimize this screen because now all we're focusing on is our literature review right here. And I wanna make sure you fully see it. So here we go. I'm even going to increase it a little bit. Okay. Let's start with this first paragraph. So in regards to dieting, Brownell debunks two common assumptions. So right now, this has a transition and an in-text citation. So this first sentence is fine. I may have to rearrange it depending on what the last sentence in my introduction is. But again, I'm okay with that. So let's move on to the second sentence, which starts with the first assumption is that with the right combination, so freeze, right there, the first assumption that's a transition because it's moving from what the first sentence says and it's guiding the reader that we're going to talk about these different assumptions starting with the first one. What I want to do is apply in-text citations to transitions to turn this into referring language. So the first obsession, obsession, okay. So something I could include here to do that would be the first assumption. So an option I have to make that happen is I could type the first assumption the author presents is that with the right combination of diet and exercise, so on and so forth. So as you can see, by adding in the author presents, it took this transition and it referred it back to the in-text citation, letting the reader know that this information were still coming from Brownell. Does that make sense? So let's move on to the second sentence, which this one starts with, the second assumption, again, we've got our transition great. We need to add in the referring language and I'm gonna use something other than the author presents to give my paper variety. So what I might choose to use this time is something that includes the author's last name. So I'm gonna go back to Brownell discusses. The second assumption Brownell discusses is the rewards that a person is expected to receive as a direct result of obtaining a perfect body. Great. So again, as you can see, we're transitioning and walking the reader through the information. We're referring back to the source it came from, and I'm using variety in my paper. Does that make sense? Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so through extensive research, Brownell comes to the conclusion, guess what? That sentence is fine. Awesome. And that may happen when you're writing out your summaries, you may naturally include the correct language for a literature review. Now let's look at this last sentence. This article contributes important data. Great. Again, we're fine there. So I would say we're finished with that paragraph. And now let's go ahead and move on to this next portion. And so when you're transitioning from two paragraphs, you always first want to read the last sentence and the first sentence to make sure that they're properly linked together. So let's read through this. I don't think there's a space there. Okay. All right. So here we go. This article contributes important data about the discrepancies people often have about the sociocultural benefits of weight loss through dieting. Miller, 2020, recaps a story of Emma, who is an Irish woman who lost roughly 200 pounds over the course of a two-year period. Well, I'm going to say right out the gate, those are two very strong sentences, but they are not linked together right now. Therefore, I need to add a transition in front of my in-text citation here to link these two paragraphs together. And in order to do that, you simply need to ask yourself, what's the relationship between these two sentences? 
Well, again, this one's a problem. This one's posing evidence. Therefore, this is an example. So I'm gonna use a transition that reflects that. So I might use for example or for instance. Miller 2020 recaps the story of Emma. Now, this makes sense. Awesome, let's move on to the next sentence. Let's see what we got here. During the first year of her weight loss journey, Emma describes her weight loss as intoxicating. Now, here's the thing. During the first year of her weight loss journey, that's a transition. Emma, though, is the person in the story, so this isn't referring to the author this article came from, so I need to add referring language right here. So I might add something like Miller Illustrates. So now it might read something like, during the first year of her weight loss journey, Miller illustrates how Emma described her weight loss as intoxicating. Alrighty, moving right along. Our next sentence reads, however, the external praise quickly turned into a double-edged sword. Excellent. We have the transition, but again, we need to add that referring language. So something you might add here would be, the story explains how the external praise quickly turned into a double-edged sword. Awesome. Our last sentence, I can tell right away it works because it already has the referring language in it of this story. Great, so now let's move on to the solutions portion. And this time we're gonna work to combine two different sources together. So it's the same process, but instead of working with one source, we're molding two of them together. All right, so starting with the first sentence, Logal et al. suggests an alternative to dieting to solve the obesity problem. I know right out the gate, we need to add in a transition here to link the two paragraphs together. I already took the time to come up with one that I think would work here. And so now it says, through the use of social psychological science, local et al., so on and so forth. Now, moving on to the next sentence, we have, the suggested alternative is an adequate transition because it links the second sentence to the first one, and it also has a referring language, we're good there. Moving on down, all right, our next sentence, this article demonstrates the importance, that sounds like a good referring transition to me, let's keep going. All right, Kinzel 2021, that's a full-blown new in-text citation. So that's a cue to me that I need to connect these two sources together because they're not coming from the same place and I need to make sure the reader understands that. So Transitions 101, what do you need to do? You need to identify the relationship between these two different points. And I know that they're both examples. However, they're different examples. So I wanna use a transition that falls in line with that. So I might type out something such as, on the other hand, Kinzel 2021 takes a personal approach. So that lets the reader know that we're switching directions. This is another solution. It's another approach, but it's going to be different. Okay, moving right along. The next sentence we have is the reason being is that oftentimes, so let's change this to referring language. I might switch this out for something such as, let's say the logic, Kinzel offers. Okay, I like it. The logic Kinzel offers is that oftentimes, so on and so forth. Cool. Moving on to the next one, I'm going to go ahead and type out the other two on my own because I want to explain the last sentence to you and I understand this probably getting pretty lengthy. Okay, so here we are with that last sentence. I just want to point out what I did because if you remember, I took the concluding sentence from one source, but because there are two sources in this paragraph, I need to reflect that. So what I went ahead and did is added in the transition with both perspectives taken into consideration. Logan et al. in Kinzel pose solutions. Let's take out that A and make it proper grammar. So as you can see, that concluding sentence wraps up this paragraph and rounds out the fact that there's more than one source in there. Okay, friends, we're almost there. You just need to add an intro and a conclusion, which I've already done the due diligence of adding in for us. There's a few things I want to point out for each one because I'm sure you have a few questions in mind. So let's start with the introduction. Now, this is going to be just like any introduction with a few minor differences. And so starting with the similarities, well, you're going to introduce your topic. And this is going to include any background information or context you may need for the reader to understand in order to understand the rest of your paper. Now, since my paper is short, there's really not much material in it. My introduction is okay getting by with a few short sentences. Now, what also is the same is that even though it's a literature review, it still needs to include a thesis statement. What's different is that that thesis statement 
is probably going to include something like literature review or review of literature because just as a traditional thesis statement tells your reader what to expect, you need to let your reader know that what they're about to read is a literature review. It's not your own personal research and information. It's your synthesis of other people's research. So for here, my best advice is to start with something literally like the following literature review and then explains what that literature review does. And so what this one does is it confirms that women who diet for weight loss experience issues closely associated with addictive behaviors that could potentially be avoided by shifting the focus to well-being rather than to achieve the ideal body. Great. Now, what you may not realize because you haven't read through my paper is these points that are included in my thesis statement are the different points that I make in these paragraphs, in the sections of my paper. And so a good strategy is to include the different points your paper makes often in the order that your paper makes them. So I like to refer to this as a roadmap formation because basically you're telling your reader, this is my paper and here's the order you can expect to receive it. So here's a roadmap starting with my introduction that's going to guide you through the rest of my paper. Now, moving down to the conclusion, keep that same logic in your mind because you can apply this to your conclusion as well, but in the reverse order. So as a rule of thumb, a safe way to start your conclusion is to restate the thesis statement, not verbatim. You're going to switch it around, but now I've restated it. So let's see here. The relentless search for the ideal body combined with the external rewards women often receive as a product of weight loss presents behaviors that are closely related to addiction. So that captures the essence of my thesis statement, but it's restated in a conclusion. And for the rest of your conclusion, you can exit your paper by almost presenting that roadmap again, but in the reverse order. And then lastly, you usually want to end with a concluding statement. And your concluding statement is simply going to be based on where your paper ends. And so for my paper, it offers solutions, but those solutions are not exact. In other words, I could suggest that further research needs to be done in order to fully understand this problem and develop a solution. So that's an option as a concluding statement. However, let's say your paper does give an exact solution. Well, you can include that solution right here. And if your paper doesn't offer a solution, you simply want to put your overarching conclusion that your paper came to. Okay, so I know we just covered a lot of ground, but let me solidify what we just went over real quick before you run away. So first things first, after you're finished with that, now you have this nicely organized, outlined literature review that's offered in a logical order that makes sense, it flows, in everything uses referring language. So the end result may look something like this. Obviously you have your reference list at the bottom of your page, which is super easy to make, especially if you have that annotated bibliography. What I wanna show you real quick is just a highlighted version of what we went over. So as you can see here, we have our thesis statement included in our introduction, check. Moving on, we have our sources organized from the categorizing we did in the first steps of our research. Check. Awesome. We've created an outline for our paper because we chose a structure. I chose to go thematic because I'm discussing a theme. I'm looking for a problem and a solution and giving evidence and examples that's based around this research topic. So that's thematic. Awesome. Now, if you'll take notice, the blue is going to be transitions and the yellow is referring language. And so I wanted to separate them. If you notice, they're next to each other because they're the same phrases, but that's what I meant by including the principles of transitions and in-text citations. So I'm not going to go through those because you walked with me through them. So I know you've you're probably had enough of that right now, but I just wanted you to see it visually for those of you that are visual learners. So you can really grasp on to what we just did. And then lastly, you have your conclusion. We restated the thesis statement as our opening. And then lastly, we ended with that concluding statement, wrapping up our entire paper. Alrighty. I wanted to pop back in here one more time and check on you because 
I know that there is a lot of material that we just covered and so my hope is that you now have a full understanding of what a literature review is from video number one and then I hope you found this video useful in actually applying the principles and knowing how to do a literature review. And by the way, I appreciate when you guys comment down below, let me know what your questions are, let me know if this video is helpful, interact with this video somehow, give it a thumbs up. All of that helps support this channel and keeps me going and it's what makes me able to do what I do. So thank you guys for being here. Like I said, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Subscribe to this channel for more videos like this every week. I'll see you guys soon.